Hey everyone, welcome again to the Rotten Horror Picture Show, the horror movie podcast where we talk about films off of Rotten Tomatoes' 200 Best Horror Movies of All Time list. My name is Clay, and with me as always is Amanda. How are you doing, Amanda? Oh, you know, I'm all right. How are you? I'm good. Are you loose? Are you nice and are you, are, are you, are you nice and uh, pliable for this week's movie? I was going to say, I think, I think the word you're looking for is, uh, yeah, I think it was, was it pliable? Yes, it was pliable. Oh, God. I can tell you when I took a shower today, my boobs were on the wrong side of my body getting ready to watch this. And you were kind of swaying back and forth while you while you washed yourself. Yeah, that's how that's how people do it. I learned how to sh- wash myself from watching this movie. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> I did. I never. I did not take a shower till I was twenty six. Is that what I just admitted to? <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, what are we talking about? Uh, we had a, a little bit of a, a schedule jump around, so this week we're catching up with our our wild card pick. Which is 1989's mm-hmm. Society, which is not on the list. Obviously, it's a wild card. Um, had you seen this one before? You had not, right? I think that was no. part of that was part of the my excitement of doing this is because this is one that I knew that you hadn't seen. This one, I, I mean this this one has reduced me to near incoherence and frequent kind of confused and also stunned silences that's what i like to hear (laughs) this is definitely a movie for me where i i came across it i did my cousin show i think my cousin told me to watch this i i have a cousin who i uh he's especially when i was starting to get into this stuff he was always the one who was like oh that's cool that you've seen that have you seen this one yet and i was like no and then i would go Uh... and watch it and uh his tastes skew a little bit more intense than mine so a lot. So this is his fault. Yeah, um, <laughs> a lot of a lot of times, a lot of times, his he he the stuff that he's into is a little bit uh, further than I like to go. But this one is like a nice pocket where I had never heard of this. <laughs> oh, don't say things like that when you're talking about this movie. <laughs> a nice deep pocket you can get your whole <laughs> forearm into. Just get your whole arm up in there. Yeah, uh, who knows what you're gonna pull out. Um. <laughs> So I had I had watched this one and I, I my first reaction to this was wow that was terrible but the last 15 minutes are unlike anything I've ever seen. And Yeah, yeah, that's a fair assessment. <laughs> <laughs> since since I've since I saw it the first time, I kind of came back to it years later and I watched it again and I was like, "Nah, you know, this I really enjoy this. This this is one of those movies where it's like, for better or worse, it is all just a lead up to that final sequence. But that final sequence just delivers in every sense of the word. And I I appreciate it a little bit more for the the uh, uh, freshman freshman in college attempt at at a metaphor that they're going for in this movie. <laughs> Yes. And it's just, it's one of those ones where it's like, it's not a good movie, but it's a great movie as far as I'm concerned. It's one where you can you can say to someone, have you seen this? And they go, no. And you go, well, you should watch that. And then when they watch it, they come back and they're really angry at you or they're really happy that they, they watched it. <laughs> I don't know if I'm angry at you, but I don't think I'm happy. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, so we're going to take a quick break, listen to the trailer, and then we will talk about society. For Bill Whitney... I've never been paranoid. Fear plays a large part in family life. I feel like something's going to happen. And if I scratch the surface, there'll be something terrible underneath. He's afraid his sister... Could you zip me up, Billy? ...is not what she seems. God, Bill, what's the matter with you? He thinks his friends are out to get him. Make waves, Whitney. You're going to drown. People are what they are. Now you have to learn to accept that. He's about to find out the truth. <laughs> so why, why are you guys doing this to me, huh? What, you've been living with these people all your life and you didn't know anything about this? It's far worse than he could ever imagine. If you don't follow the rules, Billy, bad things happen. Didn't you know, Billy boy? The rich of old sucked off low-class scum like you. Oh, guy. 
Carissa? Oh, no. so intense. Now, some people make the rules, and some people follow the rules. It's a question of what you're born to. You never were one of us. You know, you really deserve what's going to happen to you. I, I don't think so. Wait. Can't you see they're setting you up for something? You know how I hate to give you drugs. You're officially dead. Don't go home, Billy. No, 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 no. Bill Whitney is about to become one. Showtime, Billy! With society. <laughs> Who are you? Let me give you a hand, Bill. <laughs> In Beverly Hills, what you fear is only the beginning. Anything for society. <laughs> okay. Let the shunt begin. <laughs> Society from 1989, directed by Brian Yuzna, written by Rick Fry and Woody Keith, starring Billy Warlock, Conchetta. Oh, jeez. Uh, D- <laughs> Dagnisi? Denisi? Sure. Ben, sure. Ben Slack and 200 gallons of lube. Amanda, what happens in society? Clay. <laughs> so. Full disclosure, I, I, I typically find these summaries uh, fully baked from the internet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I say that because usually they're a couple sentences long. They give you, they give you some context, uh, some sense of like a, like a plot progression. Um, they leave something to the imagination, maybe. Mm-hmm. This one is just a Beverly Hills teen discovers his parents are part of a gruesome orgy cult for the social elite. All right. Well, that's it. <laughs> Good um, night, everyone. <laughs> it's not wrong, uh, but it is, it is um, kind of leaving out reductive. a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> leaving out quite a bit there. That's how you get the normies to watch this movie. I guess so. Um, so clay, mm-hmm. some things you might find in this movie include, mm-hmm. A literal butthead. Yep. Inappropriate boob placement. Always bad. <laughs> Rotten horror picture shows Mother of the Year. And we've seen a lot of mothers on this show, but but uh, <laughs> Clarissa's mother in this movie is, I think, oh, our, our favorite God. we've seen so far. She is the best. She is a treasure. Uh, family bonding. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we wrote this one as questionable parenting, but I kind of want to change it to just bad. I was, just bad I was actually parenting. thinking the same thing. <laughs> I My, think this one is the one that has transcended the word questionable very quickly and shot straight to awful. My my other suggestion, I, when, I, when I was thinking about what we were going to have in this section, my... F- my first thought was maybe we should just say it's bad parenting, but then my second thought was maybe we should just say questionable parenting and not anything else, just to really put the focus on it. Yeah, this this is probably um, the, this this is on the Mount Rushmore of questionable parenting horror movies we've seen, if not just the Statue of Liberty, in that it stands alone in how yeah. <laughs> how questionable the parenting in this movie is. It it is exceptional. We have we have not seen a movie where the questionable parenting element has dipped so closely, or I guess dipped is not even the well. I guess it is the right word for this movie into uh, like incest <laughs> and just there, there's a lot going on here that is yeah, questionable at I, best. I would even argue that dipped is too light a word. Mm. Like this plunges. Yeah. Just fist first, right into it. (laughs) So, um, yeah. So, Society from 1989. Mm -hmm. This is the tail end of the 80s horror special effects boom. Uh, Brian Yuzna, the director of this, was the producer on Reanimator, and he produced a few Mm -hmm. other movies of Stuart Gordon's. Uh, This is the first movie that he directed. He also later directed uh, Bride of Reanimator. I think he might have done the second sequel to Reanimator as well. He did, Beyond Re- Reanimator, and a couple other things. Um, this definitely has that pedigree, that 80s horror movie pedigree, and it, it's it's oh, yeah. weird because it's 
it's made in 1989, but it feels like 1985. This does not feel like we're just about to cross over into the 90s at all. No, this feels like <laughs> very, very far away from the 90s. Yeah, it's almost like if it's almost like it, I guess this is pretty literal, but it, it feels like a movie about teenagers in the 80s made by someone who was in their like 40s or 50s in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> Because they don't, they don't feel like very mo- of the time. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm totally wrong. But it doesn't feel like a, a late '80s look. But um, yeah, can you remind me when did Nightmare on Elm Street two come out? Nightmare on Elm Street two came out, I believe, in 1985. Yeah, this feels much closer to that. It does. Yeah, hairstyles alone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the aesthetic choices. Yeah, um, but yeah, this uh, this movie is incredibly horny. It's Got all sorts of <laughs> weird subtext going on. I don't know if it's subtext. It's well, it's subtext on the at first, and then it becomes very literal later on. Yeah. And it's it's just sort of like it's it's such a strange movie because you you and I we've we've said many times we gravitate more towards the stuff where they only give you what you need in order to get you through the story. Um, mm-hmm. This I don't think does that i think there's there's a lot of stuff that you are that you have to kind of infer but your inference is just a complete shot in the dark about a lot of stuff yeah they don't do a great job of laying out exactly what the setup is at the beginning which makes it a little bit hard it makes it a little bit hard to drop into Uh, did you Mm -hmm. uh, I've, i've seen this maybe three or four times now so i understand what's going on but did you find that to be the case when you're watching it Oh, absolutely. I felt right away like I'd missed the first maybe 15, 20, even 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's for something that has a premise that shouldn't be that hard to establish, it has a really hard time establishing it. Yeah, like you, you said when we were watching it last night, it's basically 80s white yuppie get out. More or less. Yes. When you said that, yeah. I was like, yeah, kind of, more or yeah. less. <laughs> but just hang in I didn't know it was coming, and you were so, like, hedging it back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's. I find that it's 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 setup is not super, uh, super clean. And it's, you're right, it's, it's something that should be very straightforward. But I don't know why it gets so lost in the weeds, because it's not like, it's not like they spend a ton of time on other stuff they they it's all kind of there it's just like they they don't drop you in at a point that's easy to kind of really track what's going on the um the one thing i was thinking would have made a difference is because when the movie starts it opens with with billy the main character in therapy Mm -hmm. and he's talking to his therapist about feeling like an outsider and feeling like he's being he's really paranoid and whatnot and the 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 therapist is kind of trying to talk him down is like oh that's just what being a teenager is about or whatever yeah which is totally fine except that billy is very well off and he's popular at school and so it it you you don't really get the sense that he's the other at all because he's very much part of the uh, for the most part, anyway, he's not part of the the, the super cool kids. He's but he's not a, he's not he's not a, a loser, you know. Yeah, and I really wished that the first act of this focused more on his relationship with his, with his family. Mm-hmm. I think that maybe would have established better why he feels like such an outsider and where his paranoia is coming from. Right, right, and he also he doesn't really. The whole the whole kind of thrust of this movie is that he's pushing back against this, you know, society, literally, this high society uh, um, thing that's out to get him. But he's he's not really pushing back against it. He's just sort of like along for the ride. He's yeah, getting... and it's only out to get him in so much as like the literal metaphor. Mm-hmm. He's not from the other side of the tracks he's not like if you're trying to extend the class war metaphor that this is very clearly going for Mm -hmm. 
it doesn't work because he is one of the elite adopted or not he's already there right and i i heard the director talking about that and uh someone asked him it's like well it's he's not really that much of an outsider and the director said yeah that's exactly the fact that he's not an outsider makes it that much more jarring that he's feeling this way and i was like "Uh, oh like oh fine i understand like conceptually (laughs) but as far as storytelling goes i don't think that's the cleanest way to to do this no if you're gonna go for a really clear I would argue heavy handed um, sort of like class warfare critique here. Having the victim be a guy who has like a high end Jeep and he's a varsity (laughs) athlete and he's student body president and he's got a hot girlfriend. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, I don't know. Maybe part of it is I just didn't find him sympathetic in any way. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally, I'm totally there with you because his, his paranoia and everything just seems to come out of nowhere because you don't really get a sense that he's really removed from anything. And I think you brought yeah. up, you brought up whether or not he was adopted. That's another thing that they don't ever actually come out and say, and would really go a long way to help if they did. <laughs> because... Well, doesn't don't don't they say in that insane ending sequence the like, uh, the grand sh- you mean the grand shunting uh, sure that mm-hmm. <laughs> go on uh don't don't his quote-unquote parents say i'm not your real mom i'm not your real dad yeah but they never like it's it's not it's never really like a point of contention it like i think he brings it up in the beginning when he's uh he's uh yeah, the therapist. I think he says, mm-hmm. "I think I might be adopted," but that's just something like kids say in in this situation where they're feeling weird going through. They notice the rest of their family is it. so you don't really take it super seriously. And then throughout, yeah. it's not like it's not like he learns that he's adopted in any meaningful way. Yeah. There's even a part towards uh, later on where he gets into an argument where he, I think this is before the the shunting scene, where he says. Uh, uh, he yells at he yells at his at, at his mother and he says you're I don't I don't who good who knows what happened to my mother or something like that. Oh and yeah. It's, and I and, and I'm watching that going like uh, so yeah I guess I guess he's supposed to be adopted which makes sense when you get through this and see what's going on to the best that you can understand what's going on. But I think pinning that down probably would make things make the through line a little bit better. Yeah. I actually think, now that we're talking about it, a great way to sort of introduce all of this would be if he was going to therapy because he found out he was adopted. Sure. And was struggling with accepting it and feeling still like part of his family. Yeah, I think that that would be great. Because I think think that's like... I uh, I, uh, One of the things that the director and, and the person he was talking to were talking about were how this movie leans on leans on the spectacle more than it does the story and i mm-hmm. it, so it goes for like the weird surrealism elements more than it does like a tight plot which i i'm totally here for that like i sure. watch david lynch movies whatever <laughs> but i feel like a movie like this this is not a david lynch movie this is <laughs> this i think you i think a movie like this you need a clear through line that you can hang all this stuff off of Mm -hmm. for it for it to real for you to really kind of like let go and sort of absorb all the all the weirdness and surreal stuff if 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 you've got one thing you can you can grab onto that's going to pull you through the weirdness i think it makes it that much easier to follow um because this isn't like it's when i watch mulholland drive Mm-hmm. I've watched that movie like 50 I think we've already said this yeah. I've already said this but I've wa- watched it like 10 times I'm still not totally sure what's happening but I but I love it yeah and trying to figure it out is part of the mystique that I enjoy mm-hmm. this isn't that kind of movie this isn't no. the kind of movie where you're like hmm I'm gonna think about what happened in that movie I just saw on a plot level for the next six months that's not really what this is about no and part of what I struggled with with this movie is that like I love 
the scenes where he feels like he's maybe losing his mind. Yeah. Um, like when he walks into the bathroom and his sister's showering. Mm-hmm. Um, and he can kind of see through the frosted glass, like a weird blurry version of her silhouette. Mm-hmm. And he's seeing her ass and her breasts on the same side of her body. Mm-hmm. Um, like that scene and then the scene where he's just had sex with Clarissa and he's like looking up at her in the bed and she's like she's half covered by the blanket and the way she's laying like her legs are in one direction her torso's in another one her arms Mm -hmm. are kind of weird but you can half sort of try to justify it because of the placement of the blanket but the longer Mm -hmm. you look at her the more uncanny she looks that kind of stuff is awesome i wish there was more of it i agree like maybe even some stuff that's on that level some stuff that's even more a little subtle i think if that were seeded more throughout the first three quarters of this movie it would add to that sense of surrealism and unreality and the feeling that you have been untethered from the normal world. Mm. This movie in the way that it actually is, there are so many scenes that are so mundane of him opening his locker and driving his fancy Jeep. Like, it, it just gets weirdly boring for such an intensely weird movie. Yeah. And, you know, the the director said that, oh, you, you don't need to focus on the plot. It's just the surreal and whatnot. Yeah. For, for a movie where they talk, where he's talking about that as, like, his intention, it's weirdly plot heavy. Yeah. Like, there's a whole subplot thing about his best friend leaving weird shit yes. in his Jeep. Yes. And, and, that and doesn't the amount to anything. Ex boyfriend. Blanchard. Blanchard. <clears throat> Blanchard. <laughs> Blanchard. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of like red herring stuff going on, mm-hmm. but there's not really. Uh, I, I don't really know what it's red herring for. Like, yeah, what is it supposed to be leading us towards? Right, right. It's not. It's like the stuff that's happening in the jeep. With yeah. the blow up doll and whatnot, <laughs> his his friend revealing that that was him doing that doesn't somehow give us an insight onto anything that's happened or yeah, his uh, girlfriend whatever. wanting an invitation to this party while they're making out at the beach like didn't mm. super need that except for the stunning and amazing introduction of Clarissa's mom. Yes, which uh, well, let's talk about her in one second. The um. The other thing that I, j- I wanted to say was uh, you were talking about how it has these like mundane sort of middle sequences. And I, as I was watching it last night, I was thinking like, man, th- there was a certain point where he uh, Billy gets lured into the woods because mm-hmm. um, he's supposed to meet the, the guy with the glasses, the smart kid. Yes. Because um, he's kind of uh, hinting that he's going to tell him what's going on. And he gets there and he finds the the kid's car, but he's dead inside the car. And so then he goes to, he runs off and he goes to Clarissa's house and finds her. And then they call the cops and they go yeah. back to the car and yep. the car's gone. It's a different car. And then they cut back. And when they were doing that scene in my head, I was like, oh, I, this is, I didn't realize how close to the end we were. Cause in my head, I'm like doing like narrative editing here where it's like, oh, well he gets drawn into the woods by the car and then he uh-huh. ends up going to the house where the, he gets like lured into the shunting thing. I yeah. assume that's what the, the <laughs> what it was. I didn't realize he was going to go to the house. Then they were both going to go get the cops and then they were going to go back to the scene of the car. Yep. And then after that was they were going to fall asleep in the car. And then the next day they were going to have a weird scene. Uh, they were going to have the, uh, the school president scene. It's like, oh man, there's a lot more of this movie that is just, it's, yeah, it's not it's not it's taking too long to do not enough stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah, like I I read a little bit of trivia that was saying um that the 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 director and, and and the whole the whole thrust of this movie was that final sequence. Like mm. it was all built around that. Like the whole first 3 quarters of the movie was just it, it came after the shunting sequence. And I was like, well, I, yeah, that makes sense. Because <laughs> yeah. I very well, much I feel actually... like this was all kind of just like, all right, how do we get there? It was like trying to reverse engineer it to get it to that that point. What I actually heard the director saying was that in the original script, that shunting thing was not in it. Like they really? he brought the surreal stuff to it later. And after I heard that, I was like, oh, my God, this would have been the most boring movie I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <if> they didn't. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But that that's not to say movies it couldn't have worked. I just don't think the script was is really there oh, for that so because I written. I think one of the things that that also stands out to me with this movie is just that I I really like um everybody against one guy who doesn't know what's going on like gaslighting type stories. Mm-hmm. They're always fun. Like The Wicker Man is one of my favorites. Oh yeah. Anytime you can do that and do it well, I think it's a very satisfying story. So this has like a kernel of that. This is one of those where I where I'm like, you know, if you took like one or two more passes at this script, I think this would have been a really tight, really great movie. I I would argue for maybe more than one or two passes at this script. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if maybe it's because of my like editing roots or whatever, but just like the way the way people speak to one another in most 80s movies is not the way any human beings have spoken to each other in the actual world at any point. Correct. Correct. This takes it to a different level, though. (laughs) Like, there are exchanges where people say things that are just inside of the context. They don't make any sense. Outside of the context, they still don't make any sense. It's not like slang. It's not. There's just in the, in like kind of the climactic sequence where where he's he's triumphantly taking the girl and leaving the house. One of them says like, "Um, you better not ever show your face here again" or something like that. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, our our hero re- replies like something like. Don't count on it. Yeah. And it's like, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> the, the, uh, Clarissa well, asking, let's... do you want, here's your tea. Do you want milk, sugar, or do you want me to pee in it? I was just going to bring that one up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's some what? really, really weird lines in this. that Like, he doesn't even bat an eye when she says that. Yes. Um, like, I, I yeah, wish he just... was just kind of like. What is wrong with you? Then I would be like, okay, I'm on this guy's side. But he's just like, haha, very funny. Give me my tea. And it's like, no, yeah. what? This is not a thing you say to people. Yeah. This definitely, it definitely does feel, once you know where this movie ends up, looking back on it, it definitely does feel like, okay, they're just, they're just biding their time to get to the last half an hour. Or yeah. So. Oh, definitely. Which I, per- you know, generally, sure objectively if you want to use that word i don't like using that word but if you take a step back and look at it is not they could have done so much more but knowing how it ends and watching people get to that point when they watch it i find very satisfying (laughs) (laughs) and because like i it's I, I do think it's 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 one where it, you're kind of like riding the line where you're going like what the hell's going on here this is all really weird mm-hmm. and the mother the mother plays into that we could talk about her in a second um, and then you go what's going on this is very strange and then you get to that ending and everything just they just throw everything out the window and it just it just ratchets all the way up into something like I if you if you stop this movie. If you if you took five five or ten people who had never seen this before uh-huh. and stopped this movie two scenes before the shunting scene and you said okay you've watched forty five minutes or an hour and fifteen minutes of this movie how do you think this is going to end I guarantee you none of them would pick this 
that none yeah. of none of them would guess and correctly. And if any of them did and hadn't seen the movie, I would be deeply worried about their mental health. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like you can get close like uh like your husband said uh he, I think they're pro- they might be from a different dimension yeah, or something. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, you you're not wrong. Yeah. But that that's just like scratching the surface <laughs> of what actually happens, you know. Um yeah, and I guess this just goes back to again my my sort of point about how I wish there was a little more of that surrealist bent kind of mixed mm. in sooner, even just maybe in the background or I don't know. It's just it's just I feel like this movie tried a little bit too much to be like on the one hand a sort of like coming of age like young man coming into his own rebelling against authority and then on the other hand the the more like paranoid horror movie aspects of it Mm, and i feel like the the two didn't quite mesh as well as they could have yeah yeah i think especially a lot of that lands on on the character of billy yeah because, you know, the, uh, screenwriting books and whatever, they're, they're always like, okay, you have to establish, and I mean, I'm, I, I, it sounds like I'm brushing this off, but it is important. <laughs> you have to establish what your character wants because the, the, what your character wants is ultimately the drive of your action for the, the movie, right? Mm-hmm. This kind of falls into that, that zone where under what does Billy want all that's written is to figure out what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> and that does not a story make, you know? Right, and it makes it hard to sort of be, like, rooting for him because... Right. It's, you know, maybe you're not rooting against him, but you're also just kind of like, all right, if he wants to know what's going on, like, why is he handing over the tape recorder? Like, mm-hmm. why is he not, you know, putting in more effort to sort of, like, I don't know, follow his family one day when they think he's at school or I don't, it just seems and like he, he's weirdly without agency in right. the whole movie. And he also kind of sucks. Yeah. <laughs> like he's, he's not a great, great person or a great character. No, he's... no. He's like so ready to just start cheating on his girlfriend. He's like, yeah. He's so I, into see, it. That's, that's part of his lack of agency, though, is because he's that scene where he hooks up with Clarissa. It's not even like that's something that he's going after. It just sort of happens to him. Yeah. And he just sort of floats through it. Yeah. And that seems to be that seems to be everything he does in this is just him floating through all of these things happening around him. Absolutely. And then he just sort of kind of meanders back and forth between locations and people like we we don't meet his best friend until like halfway through the movie uh we meet him at the beginning they're playing basketball okay but then he kind of disappears for a while yeah but it's like you you would think he would at least if if we're thinking about say something like uh like when we watched fright night and how mm, there's very similar good yeah, yeah i was going to bring that up it's not not too dissimilar from fright night yeah like I, I feel like the two the two protagonists are kind of cut from the same cloth um yeah. and there's this interesting... one one of them is cut from the middle the other one is cut from the far far end like the fringe, yeah <laughs> where it's not really not really very quality fabric <laughs> yeah it's anymore. kind of like it's like tearing a little bit yeah um mm-hmm. yeah but it, it kind of has that same at times a meandering feeling and in that same ambiguous, like, all right, you've got the main guy, and he's got a girlfriend, and he's got a friend, question mark. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just like, I don't know. In in Fright Night, in Fright Night, the relationships between the the main trio are kind of ambiguous at times or maybe you know like we don't really know if like the main character in Fright Night and Evil Ed are like BFFs or if they used to be mm-hmm. best friends and they're not anymore or whatever in this the roles are more clearly defined but it makes less sense the way the characters are used right like 
I don't know, I, I kind of lost my train of thought, but all I can think about is like, if he has this best friend, why isn't he at any point like of his own volition being like, I got to go talk to Milo. Like I need to confide in somebody right. I trust. And at this point, he's the only one I have to like, I, I need help. I need to bring him into this. And instead, Milo's the one who sort of shows up and is like, hey, what's wrong with you? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think if you look at Fright Night in comparison to this, Charlie has a very specific want and or need in that movie. Yes. He thinks his next door neighbor is a vampire, and so he needs to convince people and or kill him. <laughs> yeah. And th- it's not it's not Charlie th- thinks there's weird stuff going on next door and he's trying to figure it out. And th- cuz this one is uh Billy thinks his parents are acting weird and he's just trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. And that's not super compelling as a as a narrative drive. No. Yeah. Um but what is super compelling is <laughs> the character of Clarissa's mom oh my God. who has what's do you what's her name? Mrs. Carlin? Oh, I thought she had a funny I don't idea. remember. I, I assume I assumed you I was impressed that even in a movie like this that you you knew what his best friend's name was so i thought you had them all 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 down there because i'm terrible with the names i'm pretty names, sure but. she's only called mrs carlin i i don't know if she's actually sure. given a, a full like a, a first name last name but i i could be wrong well anyway <laughs> name aside uh one of the most <laughs> um confounding characters we've seen in, a, in any so movie much. we've done so far she's awesome but i don't even know like where she places in the story because i uh after after it was over um I, my girlfriend was like so what's the deal with the mom and i was like i said i honestly uh maybe she was a stepmom and she uh got too close so they lobotomized her and i and yeah. I was, there's no explanation <laughs> you're like, just making you're you writing have to your completely own movie make at that it point up. Yeah, or as 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 she uh, posited, maybe if you do too much shunting, you go nuts or something. I don't know. <laughs> Equally valid theory. Um, yeah, I I have my my only thing was I think she's. So at first, I thought she was going to be one of the like alien evil. I don't know if they're actually aliens. He calls them aliens a bunch. Um, I thought the mother that that Mrs. Carlin was going to be of the other species, and then by the end, I'm is she not? I don't though? think she is. Yeah, I don't know. I think she's human? Question mark or, or at least mm-hmm. not affiliated with like capital T, capital S, the society. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. she has a weird obsession with hair and eating it and eating it. But she doesn't seem to actually hurt any people other than that. And she sort of like has like a like a buddy movie moment or sequence with Milo. Yes. Um, yes. That I love like the two. I could have just watched a whole movie that was the two of them together <laughs> trying to figure out what was going on. Um, yeah. And then she actually kind of tries to defend Clarissa at the end, doesn't she? She like mm-hmm. jumps in to like like help her escape. Yeah, I think as far as like things that need more explaining, um, I think that whole family there, Clarissa's whole family, needs to be elaborated <laughs> on a little bit more because Clarissa herself is not a really consistent character no. because she starts off as like one of the the hyper cool kids that's just trying to mess with Billy. Huh. But then, for no reason really, other than I guess they slept I was together. Say, it's she decides of his magic that. Dick, come on. I guess, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, judging by that sex scene, I don't think there was anything magic about what he was doing. But um, yeah, she just like turns on that whole thing on a dime, but never really like talks about it. There's never a moment where she like rebukes everybody really. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just all because of Billy and there's just like so much more there that I think you could extrapolate out if you wanted to 
I mean, maybe it doesn't matter. You know, I don't know. <laughs> maybe by the time, maybe by the time you get to the shunting, character motivations yeah. isn't really important anymore. I well, don't know. And I, I will, I will make an argument for. I kind of love that her mom is not explained. Like, mm-hmm. I kind yeah. of wish this movie took place more in a world where that kind of stuff just happened, and those kinds of characters and people were just around sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um. Mm-hmm. Because I think that that just adds to the sort of like Salvador Dali inspired, like psychosexual weirdness going on. Yeah, and uh, to talk about that a bit, we may as well jump into the uh, the 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 deep end of the shunt. <laughs> the deep end. Um, <laughs> you know, so essentially, what we learn by the end of it is that Billy is adopted, and they've been essentially gaslighting him for 18 uh-huh. years to basically uh fatten him up for this uh shunting uh where they're going to essentially eat him yeah eating is not is not doing it justice though it's uh, <laughs> I, I get like absorb i don't even know what word you would use to describe what they do but uh it has um, more in common with how the uh brundle fly eats his food than how humans yes, do yes yeah that was another thing that you said when we were watching it was you made some uh, uh comment about well at least she didn't go through the br- blundle brundle fly teleporter and i was like yeah yeah uh keep watching but uh you know so they established this idea that this society you know the, the high society is made up of these creatures who aren't quite aliens they said they've been here forever it's actually kind of lovecraftian in that element where it's they are sort of like old ones almost who have have are just beyond the realm of understanding and they've been feeding off society the people or whatnot but they they don't seem to do this to like people at large which is strange to me like it's not like there is no dynamic like you said they were working on this this class dynamic thing clearly but there's no larger look at that. There's no, oh, the other side of town is missing people yeah. or something. You know, like there's no feel, there's no feeling like they are actively eating or or attacking the, uh, or literally sucking off the, the poor people, as they, they say in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, it's, there's. It's just uh, Billy. Yeah, there's no conversations about like. Oh, well, did you hear? The Smiths are looking for a new housemate again. So hard right, to find right. good help these days. Like, you, you could kind yeah. of play into that whole thing where it was like, you know, the gardener keeps going missing. Or, like, they have a cook, but the cook keeps quitting, quote unquote. Like, yeah, yeah there's yeah. there's some pretty easy shorthand ways to be like, you know, the the people who are tasked with doing the, like, quote unquote lower class like menial labor kind of jobs are being devoured by this group like you you don't get that the only real victims you see are Blanchard Mm -hmm. (laughs) and Billy who is a victim Blanchard who is a victim of necessity not because you know they're they're out to they're out to get him in general it's just because he's he's going to expose them he found out too much yeah, which is which is another weird thing too, because uh, the, as they were saying in the in the commentary I was listening to, uh, when they get to the end, when we were watching it, I was like, they just let him go, like after he, after he fists Turd <laughs> Ferguson there, um, and turns him inside <laughs> oh out, God. they just yeah, let they him just leave. Let him walk out. They're all like scared of him now. They, yeah, they've been cooking up this plan for eighteen years to eat this yeah. kid, and then. He beats that one guy in a fight, and then they just let him walk out the door and then get in a car and drive away. And on the commentary, the person who was with the director said, oh, that's kind of interesting that they just let him go. And the director's like, well, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's not like anybody's going to believe him if he tries to tell. He's of no he's of no consequence anymore. And I was like, I don't think that – that just doesn't jive with what you're doing here because the whole point is that they were going to eat this kid. They've been waiting 18 years, and they just let him leave. Yeah. And I, I think that's sort of like that. That is that is very representative of how much they leave on the table story wise here. 
uh, because there's no other. It's not like they're going after other uh, groups mm-hmm. of people. They don't. Um, there's not. It, it all just feels like they're they're running in place until they get to the cool stuff at the end. There's so much more I think they could do with the story. It's unfortunate that it's not uh, if, from that standpoint. Um, a better written movie yeah and i'm i i think neither one of us is asking for like a ton of like highfalutin symbolism or like extra complexity to be added to this we're just sort of asking for like a clarification of like a a basic clarification of the plot but also just like take the logic that you've set up in this movie by creating this conflict and like just extend that logic all the way to its like next conclusion right. um right and have more fun with it yeah yeah it's it's it just seems weirdly like it's it, yeah for something that is so wild and so crazy when you talk about it in broad terms it, it just comes up it comes across as so flat to me yeah yeah um so the shunt itself, what was your uh, what was your reaction to the the sequence where society they strip off all their clothes and get all gooey and start like turning into this mass of of goop among other things? <laughs> so I was not surprised by the fact that things were going to get violent. Um, mm-hmm. and I I kind of figured things were going to get somewhat body horror and gross just just based on you know who the director was and the uh Mm -hmm. promotional image (laughs) for the movie with the girl pulling her face off right um Mm -hmm. i i don't know it felt i mean so so the effects themselves are just fucking wild (laughs) yeah yeah Effects done by uh, Screaming the Mad best George, name who is a I have ever heard of. Yes, he was a uh, Japanese special effects artist and conceptual artist, and a lot of the stuff that they did in this is actually based on his personal oh artwork. <laughs> I I like I'm all for all of that. Like, I'm actually like the, the minute people start like melting together into sort of monstrosities i was like oh okay all right like this is this is completely insane uh but Mm -hmm. it's great i i just i kind of wish they had taken advantage of that sort of stuff a little bit more i Mm -hmm. i don't know it just it it seems like such a waste like the the rest of the movie I, i i feel like i keep going back to the the beginning part of the movie even as you're trying to speak more about the end. It's like, if this is the direction you're going in, I would have loved to get a couple more hints around it and had some more kind of sure. weird, like, you know, would have, been, would have been great if a couple times the sister was sort of spying on him a little bit and, and there was some kind of, like, weirdness around, like... Or, or the, the parents, parents yeah? because the parents don't... The parents feature prominently in Uh the end and in the beginning but in the middle they just sort of uh, they're not really part of the story and i mean the whole they they touch on them every now and then but it's not anything really substantial and the whole story is is him is billy dealing with his family and and the 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 social circle of his family and stuff like that so it's surprising that the the parents kind of fall to the wayside so much yeah i I think all of this kind of ends up in in as we as we're talking about it i'm thinking more and more that i i think the central problem of this movie is that it spends too much time with billy as a high school student and not enough time with billy as a son yeah that's a good way to put it i would just have liked to see more of that um but to get back to the like (laughs) batshit crazy ending of this movie um i love when his his parents and his sister go off on their own and he ends Mm -hmm. up stumbling upon them and they have like contorted themselves into the perfect 
nightmare monstrosities to sort of mock him. I think that that was so just like jarring and weird and funny. I loved it. I thought that part was great. Yeah. When, uh, uh, I mean, when you get to the sequence where his father's (laughs) face is coming out of his own ass, a literal (laughs) butthead. Um, and then like his mother and sister have turned into this weird, like, John Carpenter's The Thing monstrosity where the sister's face is coming out of the mother's yep. crotch. And it's just, it's just, yeah, it's grade A messed up imagery that is a level of uh, inventiveness and imaginativeness that I don't feel like you see a lot in movies full stop yeah. anymore. Especially, this is a... Uh, this is not a big budget movie. And so clearly they you can see where they put their money and I think it's worth it. Mm-hmm. And I I just don't see horror movies like this anymore where cuz this is my 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 pitch my my sales pitch for this movie. Basically comes down to this is the perfect video store rental movie mm. where you go you go into the store you grab this movie with the kind of cool poster with the the hot lady yeah. pulling her face off, and you go, "All right, what's going? Let's check this one out." And you put it on, and it's kind of a down the middle, low budget '80s horror movie. Some weird shit happens, and then you get to the end, and after the movie's over, you're gonna tell someone, "You gotta watch this movie." Yeah, yeah, it, it's. There's one thing in this movie that you have to see to believe. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Is, is it's like whether or not you liked it. It's it's something that you can't describe it in words. It's like a purely visual experience. Right. Um, yeah, and that's and that's one of the things that I I hold high for for horror movies in general is yeah a lot of them don't really have a level plots, but there's usually there's usually something where you go this one it's got this one scene you really got to see it, and I don't. I feel like that's missing so much in in modern horror movies because everything just gets so ironed out now and I, maybe it's cuz budgets are mm. so high for a lot of this stuff. I mean even like 5 million dollars it's a lot of money or whatever. But I don't know. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I think it's also just like stylistically not what's in vogue at the moment to sort of like it kind of store everything up for one big like denouement towards the end where like everything just goes batshit crazy. (laughs) Um, This is a little like off topic, but something I did want to remark on is uh, the use of incest in this movie. So I think that in a lot of cases, incest is used as a shorthand to show that a character is bad. Yeah. Right, yeah, definitely. And 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 there's there's sort of um I'm sure there are better examples of this in lots of like horror movies and thrillers and dramas and and all sorts of things. But I think a lot about um <laughs> The movie The Crow, because I love the movie The Crow, um, where sort of the main bad guy and his second in command are very clearly like they very clearly have a sexual relationship. And then you hear later he calls her sister. And it's like, ah, now we know how evil they really are because they're they're an incestuous couple. Star Trek Picard had the two Romulans that were brother and sister that were weirdly sexual for no reason. Yeah, yeah, that like too much tension, sexual tension and chemistry between the two of them. Mm. Um, yeah, and I always think of it kind of as like a lazy version of just being like, look how bad they are. Like, <laughs> normal social mores and rules don't apply. Like, they don't think it applies to them. They're they're clearly messed up, but it's always kind of just played for this like, <laughs> like it's it's never. This movie doesn't let it just be a simple overtone or like a light veneer 
where it's like, yeah, we're just going to like have some vaguely incestuous scenes where they're all sitting in like skimpy pajamas in the parents' room touching each Mm -hmm. other's hair. Mm -hmm. Like this movie pushes it all the way, like Mm -hmm. into Freud and beyond. And it, and it's the, the thing that I love about it is that you as the viewer are not safe from it because yeah. you're seeing it through Billy and Billy is not explicitly going, this is disgusting. Right. Like, when he goes, it's like he goes in when he goes into the, the bathroom where his sister's uh, taking a shower. Uh-huh. It's like it's almost as though they're saying, yeah. What's it like to have a hot sister? Isn't it? Does it make <laughs> you feel kind of weird? You yeah, know? <laughs> like, but yeah, like he's not. He's sort of the audience surrogate, and he's yeah. not totally one hundred percent immediately going, "Oh, oh my god, that's horrible, that's gross." What are you doing? He's kind of like, "Oh man," but I mean, she is really hot. Yeah, like she <laughs> usually, usually when they do this stuff, they'll have the sister come on to him. And yeah. then he'll like completely rebuke it. But in this one, yep. he's like, oh, yeah, it's just kind of hot. It's <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> her and boobs she... are on her back. I, yeah. I, I, it's <laughs> there's a lot going on here. And and she kind of like gleefully mocks him for it mm-hmm. at the end when she's uh, fused with their mother, and she says to him like, "Oh, if you had, uh, if you've ever had any Oedipal fantasies, like now's your chance, right, right, or something like that." And it's. It just doesn't, like, in that sense, this movie doesn't rest on its laurels. It it doesn't just, like, take these things as just, like, oh, we'll just throw in a dash of that and that will horrify everybody and that's enough. This movie is very good at saying, like, no, it's not enough. (laughs) We're going to make it worse. Yeah. And I do do appreciate that stuff. And I do think that's one of the things that it does well and better than most movies of this ilk where the psychosexual weirdness is played pretty effectively to make you kind of feel weird and uncomfortable absolutely Uh, because like i said at the top it's a very horny movie because your main character is like this 18 year old (laughs) kid who's got hot women everywhere he looks and he's one of them happens to be his sister and it's like it's a all of that stuff kind of boiling underneath this weird gaslighting plot i think actually works really well um maybe maybe not really well but i think it's i think it's a it's a good addition to make everything just feel that much more uneasy yeah and i and i think there's something about the um <laughs> like you're saying oh this movie's really horny but like being a teenager every t- like teenagers are really horny sure yeah so it plays into that aspect of it as well where like so much of this is about like that feeling of being a teenager where you're not a kid anymore, but you're not fully an adult. You're not in the world of like childhood, but you're not in your parents' world. Mm -hmm. Your relationship with your parents has changed in this way where, where you're not their equal yet, but you're also not like, you don't, you don't define yourself in relation to them anymore. Right. Right. So yeah, there, there's a lot like, I think that's part of what frustrates me about this movie is like thematically it's very rich. Like there's a lot mm. of fertile ground for it to go into and it just kind of chooses not to. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's too bad. Cause it's one where I would be like, you know, this might be, this might benefit from a remake, but I just don't think you could ever come close to that end sequence. So it's not even worth it. Yeah. I, I, I think once an end sequence like that has been done, you're, if if it's like a direct remake or sequel or whatever, you're just never going to get the same shock value out of it. Right, right. If the if the shunting had been <laughs> underwhelming, the shunting. Why is it called that? I don't know. It's great. What though. does that mean? Again, it's just such a disturbing word. It's a horrible word. But like, it. if that if that sequence had been underwhelming, or clearly hampered by uh, production value or something, then I could I could see. Okay, maybe this is worth circling back to but and anything it's so good yeah that anything you try to do is just gonna pale in comparison because you're gonna probably use cgi and even if you don't even if you just do pre- you just it's not gonna it's not gonna work the same way definitely not yeah i think i think this this sequence was the result of a very 
small group of very specific people with very specific uh, vision and skill all coming together at the right time. I, I don't know how you would ever recreate it like mm. Which, in the same spirit. Honestly, what can you really ask for more than that? You know, it's <laughs> sometimes sometimes they knock it out of the park full stop. Sometimes you get a weird movie like this that has an amazing <laughs> sequence at the end that that uh, you, you force your friends who you do podcasts with to watch. <laughs> anyway, um, this is not on our list. Would you? Do you think this deserves to be on the list? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I'm sorry. I just can't. Like, I. I. The effects are great. The concept is so weird that it's interesting, but I, I didn't find, I didn't find it even a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. I found it deeply disturbing and unsetting and, uh, occasionally. Which our brother and, brother and sister to scary, I guess. Right, right, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to say it's like not a horror movie or something. Right. But I, I just, yeah, it's, it's. <laughs> It's kind of in a in a league of its own, for better and for worse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree. I I don't think do I. I'm gonna agree with an asterisk because <laughs> sure. If I'm being completely honest, no, I don't think it deserves to be on the list of the 200 greatest horror movies of all time. But does it deserve to be on this list? There are a few movies on here that I would gladly sub out if it meant that the Grand Shunting made an appearance on this list. Absolutely, because <laughs> it's can can you, you know not to put you on the spot, but do you have any any on hand that you would cast away in order to get society on the list? Well, I hate Phantasm. Phantasm's on this list. I would I would dump Phantasm to put the to put okay. the society on here. I know people are going to yell at me because Phantasm people love that movie. But um, <laughs> I mean, American Psycho is back on the list. I, I don't think I would replace it with a replace American Psycho with Society no. just because American Psycho is, is very good. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess this would be an honorable mention movie for me where I think I think this is this is the quintessential wild card movie where. Mm. Unless I had actively chosen it and made us watch it, there's no way we would have ever watched it. So, yeah, no, I I, I think that's very true. I think uh, as evidenced by the fact that you you threw this out there to our wider group of friends and we're like, hey, anybody, anybody? Yeah. <laughs> I was no one. I answered. was fairly <laughs> upset, not upset, but a little disappointed that that happened because I was really hoping that more people would get to, to watch that, that end sequence and be horrified by it. But maybe maybe they did their research and wisely decided uh, they had better things to do with their evening. I mean, I would definitely say to anybody, I might, I might be jumping the gun a little bit, uh, but to anybody who wants to watch this movie, do it with friends or, or do it yes. with a, an, an open-minded family member or you know have have a, a google hangout going on and, and watch it in tandem whatever you need to do but like having another person there is important because there were so many <laughs> times where i was just like what the fuck mm -hmm. <laughs> and it mm -hmm. was very nice to be able to have greg you know next to me also being like well you don't see that every day yeah i i got to i think the best part of this experience watching this with you was the uh the two very different responses that i got from you and your husband which from you it was uh um i don't know what to say at the moment other than wow followed up by from him great movie and i was like all right that's all i asked <laughs> he, he, he did uh somewhat facetiously say uh this is my new favorite movie at one point <laughs> I don't think it was during the shunting. I think it was during like one of the other scenes, but it was a uh, yeah. it was good timing. I had a fe I had a feeling he was going to be in on this one. Anyway. Yeah. Um that's going to do it for society. I have hit the randomizer button. Beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, boop, boop. And next time we will be doing number 137, which is Poltergeist, Ooh. which is a uh, uh a a fairly well-known one that I'm surprised is not I'm Surprised it's not higher, but I'm also surprised it's not lower. Let's put it yeah. that way. 
I am eager to re-experience that one. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a different, uh, you know, I, I'm sure we'll talk about this in the show, but it's it's really weird looking at Poltergeist. And um, the first time I watched it, I was the age of the kids. Uh-huh. And now I'm the age of the parents. Yep. And that alone <laughs> yep. is more horrifying than any movie I can think of. Existential dread, man. Mm. But uh, that's going to do it. Thank you guys so much for checking it out. If you want to give us a rating or review on iTunes, that would be great. We're still doing our Patreon push. If you want to help us uh, get you guys some more Friday the 13th coverage, yeah. you can go to patreon.com slash Penske file. We might just start doing those and just putting them in the in the, in the the tank. Yeah. And uh, then no one will ever hear them. Secrets. But we'll know we that we did vault. Them. <laughs> yeah, well, like Disney. Every <laughs> 70 years, we'll release one episode for six months and then and then take it away. For I'm, I'm putting years. it in my will. There you go. <laughs> um, thanks, guys. Thank you, Amanda, for joining me. Thank you, Clay. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.